And this is new books for fall 2016. This is fiction. I've got a few here. One of them, I've, a few of them I've read. So this is one that I've been looking for for a long time. Uh, it's called The Forever War by Haldeman. This is a science fiction book. And I was somewhat disappointed with it, but it does have some interesting things in it. There's not a lot of thought-provoking stuff. I didn't really underline very much. There's one thing that's kind of neat because it's about... Um, they they have these battles far into space, and so when they go um, and fight these aliens way out, you know, light years away, he evokes the quantum mechanical quantum mechanics principle that to travel uh, when you go when you travel at the speed of light, time slows down, so that when you're traveling to some place light years away. Time for you is slow, so it might only take you a month or two to get there. But time for back in the Earth, uh, where um, they're not traveling at the speed of light, then uh, they're aging much faster. And he, it, it, it's an interesting uh, dilemma, I guess, or strange situation, because when he returns back home, his family is gone, his friends are gone, um, or they're much older or something like that. And it's this idea that when you're off to war, you return as a different person and what you've, you've, you do leave things behind. And I think not only is it the literal point about the consequences of interstellar war and space travel, but obviously he's trying to make a point about wartime without quantum mechanics, wartime in our time, and how people go off to war and then come back and things are different, or they're different. Or, uh, there is a happy ending with this, uh, with this uh, woman that he uh, is going with. And there's also, it's very, um, he, he paints a picture of... Um, between the sexes, it's much looser, and it's very easy. Being a, uh, you know, getting in a bed with someone is much easier. It's almost like a, it's like you're helping each other out kind of thing in the military. So the military is co-ed, and there's all kinds of problems with spacesuits, and and they land on a planet, and they're supposed to um, get a base together, and there's also this kind of neat situation where. They're defending this this fort. They get attacked by these aliens, but they put up this stasis field, and um, you can't use energy weapons in these in the stasis field. So they end up so they have ready swords and bows and arrows, and when the en enemy gets close and enters this stasis field, even they have spears and stuff, and they fight like primitives because of this stasis field. Uh, doesn't allow them to use energy weapons. And I, obviously this is another social commentary that war itself is primitive and brutal and gross and man-to-man. -man. And anyway, so there is some decent things in the book, but I was somewhat disappointed with it. But it's still worth reading. Um, there is, I guess, other books um, in, in a series. You know, there's a, The Forever War is book one. And there's other ones. There's the Forever Peace, and I'm not sure if it's in here. Uh, there's other books that are in the series, too. This guy's written a lot of books. The Forever War, 1974. And then there's, uh, there's uh, the Forever Peace, Forever Free. Those were written in 97 and 99. So he has a lot of books that he's written. But I think this is his most well-known one, and it's all right. Okay, um, here's a book on the Odyssey. Uh, by Finley called The World of Odysseus. Uh, this is supposed to be really good, and I think I read a little bit of it, but I don't remember much. Someone nicely colored in in the ocean uh, with blue uh, in this particular copy, because of course it's a used copy, as most of my books are, and there is a little bit of writing in it, but this is supposed to be some commentary on the Odyssey, which is supposed to be good, so I thought maybe that would help. I have read the Odyssey. It's a, an adventure, basically one of the first adventure books it may be the first adventure book, because even um, Gilgamesh, I guess Gil Gilgamesh, would you consider that a, it's an epic. I guess even 
of the Odyssey and the Iliad are epics. So maybe those are epics then. But basically, the, the Odyssey is an adventure book, like you read um, Harry Potter's kind of adventure books. But it's about travel and exploring and meeting these weird monsters and, um, and then returning home and finding out that people are, there's these suitors or, that are after your wife and dealing with those people. And, but, of course, everyone should read the Odyssey. Here's a really old book of Mark Twain. And a bunch of his books. So Mark Twain, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, uh, Mark Twain's Sketches, and Mark Twain's Autobiography. And it also lists The Prince and the Pauper, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and then Roughing It is another one. I have read Mark Twain's. I tried reading, no, I did read a little bit of, I think it was, was it Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry? I think it was Tom Sawyer. I read a little bit of his Tom Sawyer, and I don't know. It's it's such, it's not old English in the sense of Chaucer, which is unreadable at least to me. But it's very, um, or maybe it was Huckleberry Finn. I'm not sure. Oh, it was one of those. It's just it just seems like it's not uh, very useful for me now. But maybe that's uh, maybe that's a mistake. Um, if you've read uh, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and you think there's something worthwhile in them please let me know but i have read from cover to cover his it's called innocence abroad and i think it was one of the things that made him somewhat famous it is his adventures in a steamship overseas and there's not a lot of of interesting content in it unless you're religious because he does it this is basically a pilgrimage and he does have a lot of interesting commentary on religious um, ideas and um, various places he visits in the Middle East around the coast of the Mediterranean, Syria, and et cetera, um, that you probably will be interested in. But I'm not religious, so I'm not interested in that. But anyways, Mark Twain is also someone that Bill Whittle mentioned. Is a, is a, He wish he... he he says that if, if Mark Twain was alive today, they'd be best friends or something. But anyways, I have read His Innocence Abroad, which is okay. It's a long adventure book. It took me a long time. I think it took me a year to read. Obviously, I wasn't reading it all the time. Uh, but um, anyways, Mark Twain is uh, you know, a classic author, American author. And a lot of people at the time liked his innocence abroad because it was somewhat scandalous and it was kind of a, a making fun of this trip that these uh, these kind of snobbish upper class people were were touring uh, um, Europe on a steamship and it's kind of like a little bit of cowboy type stuff of Americans thinking they're they're so uh, important and and these people kind of come over to Europe and and uh, make comments about uh, how, how Europeans live and exist, and Mark Twain does that. So it's an interesting kind of commentary on that. But like I said, you get the most out of it if you're religious and you're interested in some of the old um, places to visit that the Christianity surrounds, the various places that, that you would visit if you went on a pilgrimage. So anyways, that's part of Mark Twain's stuff. So I, there's more of this stuff in this old text that I found. Another old text... Uh, an old copy is, I found a really nice, uh, it's not quite leather bound, but it's something like that. A nice copy of The Fountainhead, which is, I think, a fantastic book. And I, I'm reading it again, actually. Uh, I read it once a long time ago, probably when I was a uh, not quite finished high school. But now I'm reading it again. I guess it was first published in 43. I'm not sure if that's quite accurate. But anyways, here's a nice old copy with a ribbon. And I thought that for a book like this that I like very much, it's worth having a, a nice copy like that. Of course, I bought that used. I think I got that from the library sale, so it was probably like 50 cents. Here's a book of virtues. This is a nice, huge book. And I thought this might be worthwhile if I ever have kids someday or if I'm teaching. I don't think I'll teach little kids, but anyways, there's all kinds of morals in here. So little stories and stuff that you can read to a class, something to kind of springboard off of to start a class with. So I thought this was worth having. All right. Oh, that should 
Uh -oh. oh, I guess this is literature. This is a commentary on literature. This is like maybe more culture stuff, but here's the Western canon. This is uh, the books and the school of the ages. This is by Harold Bloom. You may know Harold Bloom um, was a literary critic. Always a strange thing to me that literary critics would critique Shakespeare, for example. It's like, really? Where, where are you standing to critique Shakespeare? Why don't you try writing something that, that will be as influential as Shakespeare? And of course, none of them have done it. Um, and certainly Harold Bloom hasn't either. Uh, What's funny, though, about, um, about uh, Harold Bloom, if, if you look him up, there's a few interviews of him on YouTube you can find. What's funny is that, I'm trying to think what it was. It was a, um, was it a, what's that guy's name? There's a, I can't think of his name now, but someone who does kind of famous interviews, not, I'm just, not Carl Rove, but there's like a, maybe that, there's someone like that, that does famous interviews, and Sort of like CNN does, um, kind of like Larry King Live, but not Larry King. It was someone else. I think it might have been Carl Rowe. Is that right? But there's an interview that he does, and they, they ask him about people that are getting Nobel Prizes or getting um, awards and stuff in literature and what he thinks about them. And one of them was this Mary Angelou, and I think she's a Canadian poet that got some awards. And he just is, he just is like, you know, I get in trouble. This is what he was saying, essentially, to the uh, interviewer. I get in trouble for uh, talking about these people, but it, basically they're crap. And it, but he doesn't say it like that, but that's his meaning. Um, he, he thinks that some of these people that are getting awards are just not worth reading. And he's very pretentious, but it's funny. He's, he's pretentious against authors who get a lot of praise today by a certain you know, very uh, snobbish community of liter literary writers. But the funny thing is that Harold Bloom is also one of those kinds of people, but he doesn't, he doesn't toe the line. He has his own opinions on various uh, writers. And some of the people that have gotten awards lately, he thinks are not very good, not worth reading. So there, I, I think when someone kind of is, has his own judgment and is not fitting the narrative, I tend to be interested in those kinds of people that are actually have a little bit of um, self-respect and won't just fall in line when the literature academy has a certain prevailing view about, you know, social justice and, oh, well, these people should be praised, not necessarily for their merits, but because they represent certain marginalized groups. Well, Harold Bloom doesn't give a shit about that. He will praise good work on merit, which is how it's supposed to be, not because of they're from some particular group. So anyways, that gives, that I think, deserve some respect uh, so anyways Harold Bloom here wrote this basically money making book on uh, what he thinks the western canon is and why it's important so I think that's I'll be certainly worth looking into okay the last one this is on culture I guess I better call this literature and culture um, this is a somewhat famous book sexual persona this is by Camille uh, Paglia he, she's got some very good interviews online she was part of the feminist movement back in the day, but she now, she does not agree with Third Wave and thinks that it's corrupt. Uh, so this was a famous book that got her, um, uh, made her popular in the feminist community in, in the early on, uh, in the early stages, the first and second waves. But the Third Wave, she thinks, is corrupt. And she, she talks about it, um, that it's, it's gone awry now. And modern-day feminists hate her for that. They, um, they want to, they, they're looking for new demons, right? It's kind of interesting when you have these movements and you have legitimate concerns and they win those battles, those older aging professors or activists or whoever they are, they retire, but they leave younger people in the movement who need a new battle because their battle was won. So that's when you get third wave feminists who battle for other groups, but the old the old wing, they thought they think the battle's over. They don't want to engage in this new battle. They think that this new battle's wrong. So it becomes kind of a, a, a battle between the old and the young in this third wave movement are trying to invent work for themselves and try to invent a new movement, a new battle, because the old battle was won. Equal rights were won a long time ago, but they need a new battle. So anyways, that's where that kind of stuff comes in. So I thought that'd be worth reading someday. 
All right, that's new books for literature and culture. And the last section will be economics and business type books. And most of that will be what I got out of the Mises Institute uh, uh, um, order.